Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Files with Taxes Your Way podcast. My name is Ida Celli, and today's topic for our podcast would be the tax update for 2023. And to speak to us about these updates is our very own Jerry Vitarati. Hi, Jerry. How are you? How's it going, Ida? How's everything? Good, good. good. <laughs> Another tax season, right? Another tax exactly. season. So, exactly. and tax update, of course, the big one, right? This is the big podcast that we do every single year uh, where we talk about what's new for 2023, for 2023 tax year specifically. So, what's on the plate? Okay, so we're going to have a couple of topics we're going to talk about, and you're going to explain to us what's the difference this year, all right? So, let's start off with the tax free first home savings account. What is that all about? Yeah, so that's the big tax change, really. And what the government has done with a tax-free first home savings account is create a new registered account. Registered meaning that any uh, any money you place into these accounts will be tax sheltered, just like an RRSP in a TFSA. So similar in concept, but the tax-free first home savings account, or what I'll call now FHSA, it's a mouthful to keep having to say tax-free first home savings account. So I'm just going to say FHSA, make it a lot simpler. The purpose of it is to shelter money or to put money in a tax sheltered account in order to allow you to have savings to put on a down payment for the purchase of what the government considers as your first home. Now, what does the government consider as a first home? It means that you have not lived in a home that you owned in the last four years. So the moment you meet that criteria, you're 18 and over and you're a resident of Canada, you are eligible to create this FHSA. Okay, this account. Account. So there is a limit to how much you can contribute to this account, which is set at $8,000 annually and $40,000 over a lifetime. And the contributions, like an RSP, are tax deductible, meaning that you reduce your taxable income by the amount of your contribution. Okay, now what happens? Later on, and remember what I mentioned is that the funds are tax sheltered, meaning that they can accumulate and they accumulate on a tax sheltered basis. The government is not going to charge any tax while the funds are within the account. Now, what happens when you've saved money in this account throughout the years and now you are ready to purchase what the government calls your first home? Again, remember, first home means you haven't lived in a property that you owned in the last four years. The moment you're ready to make that withdrawal and your and your first time homeowner as of that point of the withdrawal the kicker is that the withdrawal is tax free so you withdraw money from the account and then you put it for the down payment of the purchase of your first home so the advantage of the FHSA is that it's kind of like the best of both worlds meaning RSP and TFSA on the RSP side your contributions are tax deductible on the withdrawal side, your withdrawal is tax-free, like a TFSA. So that's the advantage. But remember the condition. It has to be for the purchase of a first home. Now, what happens in the case where you don't purchase a first home? We know that in the last several years, prices have gone through the roof, especially in, in many Canadian cities, many Canadian urban centers. Let's say you, know, you create your FHSA account and you never purchase a first home. Well, in that case, what happens is the account, you're allowed to hold it for at least 15 years. And after the 15th year that you created the account, the account expires, meaning that you would have to then transfer the funds from that account to an RSP account in that case. So that's the advantage here is that even if Maybe you're not thinking of purchasing a home anytime soon. Uh, anytime soon, in this case, it's still worthwhile to contribute to an FHSA. Even so, for example, if you are uh, a person who maximizes their RSP deduction limit every single year, and you are eligible for an FHSA, the FHSA becomes kind of like a de facto extension of your RSP. So even if you have, you know, no intention of buying a home, or if you're not going to buy a home for several years, still worthwhile. If you put money into the FHSA and you never purchase a home, you can simply transfer the money back to an RSP account without any tax consequence. And the kicker here is that when you transfer those funds back to your 
the RSP account, it doesn't affect your RSP room and limit. So that's another advantage of the FHSA. Now we have, you know, of course, there's a lot more conditions that deal with the FHSA. We've written a really detailed blog article on our website on ufile.ca. Uh, when you're going to see the description of this video, of this podcast, we're going to post the link to the tax update article. And within that article, we have a link to the detailed FHSA article that explains to you A to Z how this new tax shelter program works. Quick question for you regarding that, uh, the deduction. Is it like an RSP where you, you can deduct up to, uh, you, sorry, you can contribute up to 60 days the, for, uh, the following year for it to count? Let's say I make my contribution now, can I still apply it for my 2023 tax return? That's a very good question. And the answer is no. On that end, there it differs from an RSP. So we know that right now, by the time most will see this podcast, uh, we're still going to be in RSP season, right? For, for 2023, which means the first 60 days of 2024. Remember, for everybody who's listening to us right now, the deadline is February 29th, not March it's 1st. A Don't it's, make, a it's a leap year. Don't make that mistake. It's always the first 60 days. So it is February 29th until midnight. Okay, that's your deadline for RSPs. However, I digress. Let's go back to the FHSA. So the, for the FHSA, it's calendar year. So you had to have already contributed within the calendar year to make it count for that year, meaning that your contributions would be eligible up until December 31st, 2023. Now, another aspect, is, and it's a great point which you brought up with the contributions, another aspect uh, that, that I want to add to this as well is that your, I mentioned that it's an $8,000 limit every single year, and it's $40,000 cumulative over a lifetime, okay? Now, the key, though, is that unlike an RSP account or even a TFSA account, your limit does not start accumulating until you create an FHSA account, even if you don't fund it. So you have to be very, very careful with that. RSPs and TFSAs, whether you have accounts in those programs or not, uh, whether you created accounts within those programs or not, your limit is accumulating from the moment you become eligible. So with the RSP, it's when you start earning income, right? When you start having business income uh, or uh, employment income, okay? You start, it's 18% of that income that becomes your limit. TFSA is the moment you turn 18. The moment you turn 18, you get the flat, which I believe right now it's, set, it's a set at $7,000 and accumulates every single year, regardless of whether you've created accounts, not for the FHSA. You must create an account in order to start accumulating your limit. So that's the key. Even if you don't have the funds right away to fund your, uh, your FHSA account, create your accounts anyways. That way you can start accumulating your room. Okay. Very interesting. So let's go on to the next topic is the Canada Workers Benefit. Yes, so this is not new. I mean, the Canada Workers okay. Benefit has been around for a long time, right? The government has introduced this program. For those of you who don't know what the Canada Workers Benefit is, it is a refundable credit, meaning that whether you are taxable or not, the government's going to basically give you the credit in cash. It doesn't matter whether you are, you know, within within the threshold of being taxable, you're still going to get the credit. And it is targeted towards employees and people who have what the government calls working income that are at a lower income level. So essentially what the government is trying to do with the Canada Workers Benefit is to incentivize you to continue working. Okay, so even though you've got a lower income working, it could be somebody who's a student who, who now graduated and is transitioning into the job market, or somebody, for example, who was on welfare and is now trying to transition into the, the job market, okay? So the government is incentivizing you to get into the job market by giving you this tax credit if you have working income and it's a lower income. Now, what the government has done for 2023, it, 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 for 2023 is to basically pay you half of that credit that ordinarily you claim on your tax return. They'll pay it to you half in advance and they'll give it to you as a quarterly payment. Okay, that's what they're going to do. Okay, so if you are eligible for the credit for your 2022 tax year, the government's going to give it to you now as a quarterly installment starting, and they did this last year, starting in July 2023, they started paying in advance half the credit you would ordinarily be entitled to as a quarterly payment starting in July. And the last payment was in January of this year. That was the last payment. Okay, now, of course, remember this credit is in advance and conditions can change, right? So for example, let's say you, last year, 2022, uh, you just got into the job market. 2023, you got a promotion. 
And now you might be making more income than what you were making the year before. And this credit is a progressive credit, meaning the more you make, the less you're going to get of that credit up until you hit a certain threshold and the government cuts you off on that credit. Okay. So it's based on your income. So because the government is estimating, they're giving it to you in advance, they're basing it on your 2022 tax year, but your 2023 could be different. So what the government's going to do is that they're going to send a slip to anybody who received and collected the credit in advance in order to declare it on their tax return to reconcile. And basically by reconciling, meaning they're going to check whether they overpaid you or underpaid you this credit. Okay. And that's what's there's going to be a new calculation on schedule six that's going to show that. Okay. So if they overpaid you, you would pay the difference essentially. Okay. Along those lines. Okay. So is it not the, 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 the calculation is more convoluted than that, but it's a, the logic is along those lines. Okay. You're going to, you gonna have to reconcile between what they gave you in advance and what, and, and the, what's called and what you're supposed to get based on the calculation of tax term. Because again, our situation changes. You know, I graduate one year, I just start working, I'm eligible for the for the for for the uh, Canada Workers Benefit, but if I get a promotion, I might I might no longer be eligible for that credit. So that's why that reconciliation would come in. Okay, so it's it's an improved version of the of that the credit, right? Yeah, it's improved in the delivery, right? That's what it yeah. is. That instead of waiting to file your tax return by April of the following year, you're getting the credit in advance uh, through quarterly installments. That's essentially what it is. Okay. Now, I believe this is something a little bit new this year, or it's been modified. It's the residential property flipping rule. Yes. Yeah, that's an interesting one. That's a really, really interesting one. That's the government uh, trying to patch up the holes in the Income Tax Act. Okay, that's essentially what they're doing in this case. Now, in all honesty, this rule really existed already. It was never written in law, but the government applied it administratively. If they noticed people who were buying and selling houses really quickly, okay, and they did this several times, okay, the government would essentially start auditing these individuals and tell them, look, you have a business. You, this is not a capital gain. This is not a home that you're living in, that, you, that, that, that your intent was to live in, and all of a sudden you got this fantastic offer to sell it again. Okay, you really have a business. You're a property flipper. So now what the government has done with this rule starting in 2023 is that they've written it in law now. Okay. And what they've done is essentially uh, the rule is if you purchase the residential home and you sell it within, within 12 months of when you purchased it, okay, you trigger what they call the residential property flipping rule, which is this new rule. Again, we mentioned, we, we give you all the details in the blog article, which we're going to post the link in the description of this podcast. Okay. And what the rule is essentially, ordinarily, when you sell a residential property, okay, and it's a taxable residential property that you have to declare, uh, then at that point, it is a taxable capital gain, meaning that 50% of the profit that you make off that sale becomes taxable income. So 50% is exempt, 50% is taxable income. That's ordinarily how capital gains work, okay? But when you trigger this rule, what the government is doing is saying, you know what? This isn't a residential property anymore. This is an inventory item in a business. And when that happens, when it's inventory in a business, guess what? When you sell and you make a profit on an inventory item, it's no longer a capital gain. It's a sale from an inventory. And that the, the, the profits from that you have to include at 100%, not 50% that you ordinarily would for capital gain. Let's do an example, okay? Just, just understand the concept. You know, I purchase a home. Okay, for two hundred thousand, and I and I purchase it in the middle of the hot market that we saw between two thousand twenty two thousand twenty two. Okay, I get an offer right when I move in. That's it, and the person says, "Hey, you know what? You know, I want to get this property. I'm going to give you a hundred grand more." So within a couple of weeks, I make a hundred grand. Okay, so they they give me three hundred thousand to take the home away from me. Now, the 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 example is overly simplistic because now a lot of people are going to sit there and tell me, "Where the hell are you going to find a property of three hundred thousand in Canada?" Right? I mean, I mean, you know, that's a unicorn. You know, I mean, that that's a total unicorn. You know, uh, let's not kid ourselves. But you know, just just bear with me. I'm just trying to simplify the numbers. Okay, so so we understand the concept. All right. So I sell it to this person for three hundred thousand. I make a quick a hundred thousand. Ordinarily. I would be taxed on 50% of that 100,000. That's what we call the capital gains inclusion rate. So when you make a capital gain, whether you're selling stocks, whether you're selling bonds, uh, you know, whether you're selling mutual funds and you make a profit, only 50 from a taxable account, only 50% of the profits are taxable. So you declare that as income. So in my example, I would be declaring $50,000 additional income. 
But the problem is I sold it within 12 months in 2023. Okay. So now I trigger this new rule. And what that means is that that 100,000, not only is it no longer a capital gain, but it is a sale of an inventory, which means that the 100,000 profit that I made is fully included in, in my income now. It's no longer 50,000, it's 100,000 that I have to declare. And not only that, I have declared as business income. Okay, and that's an important distinction because when I sell it as business income, now that income is subject to other contributions that I have to make. Not only do I pay tax on it, but I also have to contribute, for example, to CPP, to, to the Canada Pension Plan, because now it is an additional income and I have to pay the employer-employee portion. All of us pay CPP from our employment income. Whoever's employed right now watching this, we know this. We make contributions to the CPP plan, uh, what's called directly, okay? We make uh, contributions, uh, to the CPP plan directly from our, our pay and our employer give kicks in the equivalent amount. But when you're self-employed, there's no employer. You're the employer, you're the employee, which means you pay both. Okay. You have to pay both the employer employee portion of CPP on top of it, on top of paying the tax. So it's very, very penalizing what the government is doing. Now, like I said, they've been applying this rule for many years, administratively, they've been doing this. Now they've written it in the act now. They now, they, now it's official. There's no wiggling your way out of it. There's just a few, but there are exceptions to the rule. And the exceptions are, for example, uh, uh, the exceptions are, for example, there's a death, for example, you moved because you had a new employment, uh, you moved because you you need to house a, a, a relative and you needed a bigger home, for example, uh, a divorce is an example. Uh, you know, you had to, in order to settle the divorce, you had to sell your property within 12 months. Uh, another example is a bankruptcy. That's another example as well. And these are all exceptions to this rule. So the moment you meet that exception, then the property is still considered as a, a real estate property and it becomes capital gain instead of business income. The other penalizing factor of this is that because the government no longer considers, let's say you don't fall into the exceptions that I just named. Let's say we do, you don't meet one of those. Okay. But, but you could say, but you know what? I lived in it, right? I mean, even was, let's say two months, I still lived in it, which means I could claim it as a principal residence and I could exempt myself from it. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. Why? Because what the government is doing, and they've written it cleverly in the act, what they've done is they've changed the designation of the property. It is no longer a real estate property. It is inventory. So you can't claim a principal residence exemption on inventory. It's no longer real estate property. So therefore, they disqualify you from the principal residence exemption as well. So yeah, the government really, uh, really penalized these individuals. And it makes sense because when you look at how the prices just flew from the pandemic all the way till, till the interest rate hikes, okay, a lot of these individuals were flipping properties and simply declaring them as capital gains. Okay, and the government's simply trying to crack down on them. Okay, do you have that kind of cash? <laughs> oh, I wish. Well, again, I, I would I would love to close my eyes my, right now and, and dream of, of that $300,000 home that exists in Canada, you know, <laughs> the real estate property. I, I Like I said, I think I, I think I called a unicorn here. You know, I don't think I don't think it exists at all. But anyways. All right. Uh, moving on. The next topic is the multi-generational home renovation tax credit. That's yes. something new or it's been it's, it's an extension of something that was there already. No, uh, we might. You might be thinking of the old renovation tax credit that happened during the 08 crash, right? When when the okay. when the markets when the when we had the the Great Recession, as is, as it's called, right? I believe that's what it's commonly called. Uh, when the Great Recession happened, uh, there was the home renovation tax credit at the time, where you could claim up to ten thousand dollars of expenses for renovations. It was all, it was temporary. Uh, it was a temporary measure that was only there, I think, for a year or two, if memory serves me. And then they scrapped it. This one is different because it's a little bit stricter in the in the criteria. Area, but much bigger limit in what you can claim. And on top of it, it is a refundable credit, which like I mentioned, with a Canada workers benefit, even if you're not taxable on your tax return, they'll still give you the credit in cash. That's essentially what a refundable credit means. Okay. So the multi-generational home renovation tax credit, it's great news really, because it, because when we see the, the housing market again and how it exploded and how it became, you know, how the prices just became ridiculous, uh, the government really responded well uh, to that. And essentially what it is, is if you as a caregiver 
decide to house what the government calls a qualifying individual. In other words, your relative. Okay. And, and, and we'll see in a minute what that, you know, who the eligible relative is. And you decide to renovate your home to create what the government calls a secondary unit or dwelling. So you're creating a second home within your home is essentially what you're creating. Okay. When you, when you have renovation expenses to do that, the government is going to give you this credit, which is the multi-generational home renovation tax credit. Okay. Now, the credit itself is capped at $50,000. So you claim up to $50,000 of renovation expenses, and you could claim 15% of those eligible renovation expenses. Now, who's the relative that you have to house? Okay, and who can claim the credit? Can it be the relative that you're housing, or is it only the caregiver that takes the credit? The answer is both. Both the relative that you're housing and the caregiver who's gonna house this individual can claim the credit because what can happen in these scenarios is it is the relative's home and the caregiver will come and move in right it will come and move in and then basically create the secondary unit in order to house the relative so in either case both can claim as long as they prove that they live together and the and one of them at the very least owns the home okay that's the key uh, to to be able to claim the credit right now what does the government consider? Now, who are these eligible relatives? Who is this person that, I, that, that as a caregiver you would have to house? It has to be either somebody who is 65 years of age and older or somebody who is an adult, 18 and over, and is eligible for the disability tax credit. So they are disabled, essentially. Okay? As long as the, it's those two individuals and the relative has to be you know, uh, uh, what's called a non, what, what we call non arms linked relative, meaning that it has to be somebody very close to you in blood relation. It's got to be your mom, your dad, your grandparents, uh, your, your children, your brother, your sister, your uncle, your aunt, your niece, your nephew. Those are the relatives that it has to be one of those relatives, a blood relation, not necessarily blood relation, though it could be from adoption too, but it has to be one of those types of relatives in order to be eligible to claim the credit. Now, the other catch is the fact that it has to create you have to create a secondary dwelling or a secondary unit okay within the home meaning it has to have its own private entrance it has to have a bedroom it has to have a kitchen and it has to have a bathroom that's the catch okay that it really has to be a secondary dwelling another another home in other words with its own private entrance that's the key as long as you meet that criteria and your and your renovations are for the creation of this kind of unit and for the housing of the relative that i mentioned before you are eligible now for this credit and it's a great credit up to fifty thousand dollars of expenses and you're claiming 15 percent of those expenses as a credit okay uh now from there uh, the uh, renovation expenses have to be enduring in nature, what the government calls enduring in nature, meaning it can't just be, you know, just a paint job, right? It, it's got to be, you know, fundamental renovations that you're that you're making to the home, uh, and it can't be anything related to maintenance. And you can't, for example, deduct furniture that you put into the to the home. That's not eligible. It has to be really, you know, a, a construction project is what it has to be. And the year you can claim that credit is the year that the work has been finalized, that the, the, the work has been completed. So for example, if let's say I start the renovations in November, 2023, and they end uh, in, uh, let's say March, 2024, I can only claim the credit in 2024 when the work is completed. And it's once in a lifetime that you can claim this credit. Meaning that let's say you create that secondary unit, 10 years later, you decide to sell and move to another home and you want to create another secondary unit for your eligible relative, doesn't work. Okay, you cannot claim because it's only once in a lifetime. If the credit is still available then. <laughs> Absolutely. As we saw with the renovation tax credit, it didn't stay very long. So we'll see how long the government's gonna is going to leave it. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Is there any diff any changes to the tradesperson's uh, tools expense detection? Yes. So, so that's a very, uh, very minor change, uh, in the sense that the government is extending, is is basically doubling the limit that you can claim for a tools expense. For those of you who don't know what this means, uh, you know, so basically, picture a tradesperson, whether it's a plumber, an electrician, uh, something along those lines, a mechanic, for example, would be another example of a tradesperson. So these individuals can deduct the cost of tools that they have to pay out of pocket. Okay, that their employer has not reimbursed them for, and this is actually very common. It's Especially with mechanics is very common uh, that, that, that you would see. That's why mechanics actually get a second deduction on the tax return for their expenses, uh, while other tradespeople only get one, which is the tradesperson tool expenses. Now, the government will cap 
what you can claim as a deduction for the cost of the tools that they paid out of pocket. Normally it was $500. Now the government has extended it to $1,000. Okay, so they essentially doubled the limit for that tools deduction. Okay, now the big one. Yes. That everybody wants to know. Home office expense, the flat yes. rate method. Does that yes. still exist? Drum roll, it's gone. <laughs> So there you go. So, I, you know, the point that you brought up with the multi-generational is so valid because, again, you just never know when the government is just going to pull the rug, you know, and say, forget it. They're just going to pull the plug and say, that's it. So when it comes to home office expenses, the government during the pandemic, starting 2020, all the way up to 2022, they introduced a new deduction, uh, a new way, actually. Sorry, the deduction was existing, but it's a new way of computing home That's office expenses, fine. which was called the flat rate method, right? So as long as you're required to work from home for more than 50% of the time due to the pandemic, okay, then you're entitled to a $2 per workday deduction as a, a home office expense deduction on your tax return, meaning you're deducting these expenses directly off of your net income. Okay, so that's essentially what the government allowed. I felt it was a great, uh, uh, a great program uh, because of the fact that you didn't have to go through the regular administrative requirements that that people who were already working from home uh, before the pandemic had to go through in order to claim their home office expenses. Which is number one, they needed a certificate from their employer, which you call the conditions of employment, which is the T two thousand two hundred form, where the employer had to sign off telling the government that this employee had to work from home for more than fifty percent of the time. Okay, the second red tape was essentially you had to itemize your expenses. You had to keep your receipts and then you were able to deduct your rent. You're able to deduct your electricity, uh, your utilities. You were able to deduct your home, uh, your home internet and some supplies. Okay. You were allowed to deduct, but of course you were, you were limited to uh, the percentage, the, the, the square footage of your home office vis-a-vis -vis the square footage of your home. So for example, if your home office represented 10% of your, of your home space, then you're only entitled to 10% of those expenses. So as you can see, it's, it was quite lengthy as far as what, uh, what had to be done in order to claim home office expenses. The flat rate method did away with all that. The flat rate method said, look, are you required to work from home more than 50% of the time due to the pandemic? Perfect. Claim $2 per workday. That's it. No certificate, no convoluted calculations of measure with measuring tapes to measure, you know, how big your home office is and then measuring the rest of your home, et cetera. You didn't have to do any of that. Unfortunately, the government has done away with that. And now we're back to the old program uh, or what, what the government had called the detailed method, uh, where you have to now claim, uh, you know, each expense, you know, have proof of those expenses, keep your receipts handy in case you get audited by the CRA. Uh, and then again, you're, you're only claiming based on the square foot footage uh, of your home and you need you need the certificate from your employer in order to be able to claim them unfortunately it's, uh, it's the unfortunate reality well we knew it was a temporary fix for the, for the for the moment so uh quickly what are the changes for the province of quebec that's the only one that ha has to be a separate tax return is done so yes Okay, so, so the changes for Quebec is, uh, number one, the two first tax brackets have been reduced by 1%. Okay, mm -hmm. so for example, when you made income, uh, your, your first $49,000 of income was taxed at 15%. Now it will be taxed at 14%. Uh, and then the next $49,000, which would reach almost 90000 or uh, no, almost 100000 actually, almost 98000 and change uh, the next the next almost fifty thousand dollars will be taxed at twenty percent. Now it will be taxed at nineteen percent. So that's the big change. Now you probably won't see a big effect on your tax turn because in theory you should see the effect because for example if you hit the second tax bracket let's say you make sixty thousand dollars well you already have a tax savings of almost five hundred dollars right it's one percent of the first fifty thousand you're already saving five hundred bucks the cat but the thing is your payroll your payroll taxes should already have reflected this so in july your employer was supposed to reduce the payroll taxes they were they were deducting from you uh for you know for your employment income so you won't see a big effect but you know, hey you were getting more money though during the year since July. So that's great news uh, for everybody. Now, uh, the next thing to mention about Quebec is the residential property flipping rule. Same rule in Quebec. All right. So, so it's exactly the same. Uh, so they're going to apply the same rules with the federal data. Again, you sell your home within 12 months.
months, you're triggering this rule, and now it is business income included at 100% instead of 50% of a capital gain. So exactly the same rule as on the federal side. Great, and I think that recaps our update for for our tax update for 2023. So that was a mouthful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so any quick last words? Uh, our uh, very website. Simple. Yeah, sure. Let me very simply put uh, uh, everything that we spoke about today with a lot more detail, because uh, of course we, our, our format doesn't allow us to go through all this kind of detail for all these measures. Uh, so all these things are located on our website, which is at ufile.ca. Uh, simply go to the tips and tricks uh, tab, just hover over it, and then you're going to see the ufile blog. Uh, what we spoke about in this session, in this podcast, uh, I will we will provide a link uh, directly to that blog article where you can have all the details that you need in order to be able to maximize your tax return and be able to benefit uh, from uh, you know, these measures uh, that the government uh, has announced. But again, our website is a tre treasure trove of information when it comes to taxes. Go to our UFAL blog. Once you go to our blog, you simply go one back and you'll see all of our blog articles where we, where we write about a lot of interesting topics. Uh, the other thing that we do as well, we, we produce a lot of YouTube videos where we try to educate you about different, uh, about different things about taxes. For example, this podcast on YouTube and also uh, in audio, for example, on uh, Google Podcast, on uh, Apple Music, uh, on all your favorite podcast uh, platforms. Uh, it's all there. Uh, you know, on UFAL, we also do, we also do uh, sorry, on YouTube, we also do uh, how-to videos within the software. So how do we claim these credits? For example, we're going to have some of these new tax measures. We're actually going to show you uh, a, a how-to, we're going to have how-to videos on YouTube to show you how to claim uh, these amounts. Or if you're subject, for example, to property flipping rule, how do you you know, how do you how do you trigger it in the software, for example? So all these resources are there for you. We do it free. We just give it away. You know, we're just giving all that uh, that information away. So take advantage, take advantage of it, and go ahead and maximize your tax returns. All right. So that concludes our podcast for today. Thank you very much, Jerry, and I'll see you next time. Thank you, thank you, Ida. Take care, everybody.